so pleased to see you today. Thank you so much for coming. Sorry to barge into this time of worship, but God hadn't left. He's still here. Would you just turn around and say to somebody, I'm so pleased to see you in church. It's lovely to see you today. The children are going to go to their program uh, right now. So God bless you, the children. It's been really good uh, having you in the service. If uh, you go out right now, and let's take our seats. Uh, this evening is a very special uh, evening. It's the start of our prayer course. I know some of you have been away on holiday, and you come back specially uh, for this. Uh, but at six o'clock this evening, we're starting our prayer course. Now, some of you will say, well, all the videos are online. All the discussion questions are online. Why don't I just sit at home and watch it? Well, if you're anything like me and you try and, what, and, you try and do a course, you'll get about halfway through maybe the first session and then get distracted. So we're going to be here six o'clock. But if you do want to do this course with a small group, I've got some leaflets. But I've got a video to share with you uh, all about it, if that's OK. so fun. So that'll be tonight at six o'clock. I know that you're going to enjoy it. We've got some lovely cakes as well, refreshments for you. So do please come along, bring a friend. Why don't you just say to the person next to you, I will come if you come. <laughs> if you sat on your own, Amy, you've made your mind up, haven't you, love? Uh, but that would be tonight. I'd love it if you could come. Uh, that would be really good. Some of you uh, do it in small groups, so that would be fine. Uh, the other thing I just want to let you know is that I do send out an email every now and then, and I'd love it if you got that. So uh, I need your email address uh, to actually get that to you. We're going to come around the Lord's table now. It's a metaphorical table which you'll be pleased to know about in these COVID world that we're living in. So I just wonder, has, have you all got one of these communion cups? You need a couple up here. Barry, I just need a few up here. Uh, is there anyone else that needs any? I've got loads available. I'm in, before you open them and start, I'm in Luke chapter 24. And so if you've got your Bible... I'd love it if you turned there. Uh, for those of you watching online, if you want to press pause and get your uh, communion things ready, that's okay. Uh, but in Luke chapter 24, it's Resurrection Sunday. And there's two disciples that have left Jerusalem after everything that's gone on. And they got very heavy hearts. And they disappointed and discouraged about this whole situation. They didn't believe that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. When the Lord Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, the communion, he did it that we'd remember what he did for us, and that we'd be thankful, that we'd give thanks. I don't know about you, but sometimes you get a gift or somebody helps you with something, and if you don't remind yourself of it, you forget. But we come and do this on a regular basis. Do this in remembrance of me. To keep that heart of gratitude to the Lord Jesus. Uh, Luke chapter 24, verse number 28 says, As they were approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, 
and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? My prayer is that your eyes will be open today, that you see Jesus in the worship, in the reading and preaching of God's word as we gather around the table, maybe in the encouragement from a friend, that your eyes would be opened and that you would see Jesus. If you've got a pulse, you've probably known disappointment. You've probably known some discouragement. You've probably had a heavy heart at some point for something or other. And my prayer is that today that you'll know your heart burning within you with the fresh vision of the Saviour, with how he feels about you. Last week I talked about uh, Thomas and the Lord Jesus appearing to Thomas a week after the resurrection. And he said... Look at my hands and my side. Put your finger in. Put your hand in here. It's the wounds of Jesus that give us that confidence and reassurance that our sins are forgiven. If you're living in guilt as a believer, if you're living in shame as a believer, it's not what the Lord Jesus wants for you. He died on the cross to take our guilt, and take our shame, and take our sin. Let me pray for you and, and then we'll take the bread and the juice together. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much that you are here by your precious Holy Spirit. Father, many of us struggle to sense your presence. Lord, you know it, all of our private hearts, all of the secrets, the things we don't even know as well. And you know in the room where there's discouragement, uh, where there's a heavy heart, where there's disappointment. Uh, where there's pain. Lord, you know about all of those things in our hearts. And I pray in your name that you would open our eyes this morning, that we would see Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, and comfort and heal and give us fresh vision. Lord, light for our path, wisdom for all the decisions that we're facing. Lord, we need your encouragement, the sense of your Holy Spirit presence. Lord, I pray for burning hearts with enthusiasm and passion and love for you again. Lord, would you meet with your people today? Those of us in the room, those of us watching online, Lord, we watch. Come and have your way, Lord, in us. Come and have your way. Come and have your way in us, Lord Jesus. Why don't you, in your own words, uh, bring your thanksgiving and your remembrance and your requests to the Lord Jesus right now in this moment, in your own words. Feel free to take the bread and the juice, please.
Would you stand with me?
May we rest in that presence and may we be open to your spirit now as Eric comes to speak your word to us. Amen. Mm, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, worship team, and also our techie team this morning. And thank you, folks, for being with us online and in person. It's great that we can come together in the Lord's name. And it's his presence among us that brings such blessing and the encouragement. There's another in the fire. There's another, thank God, this morning with us in every circumstance of life to enable us to go through, and we give him praise. Um, I want to be able to share with you this morning from a couple of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus that introduce us to the theme of life in the Spirit, of living in the Holy Spirit. And uh, I've, I've made an equivalent, I've likened it to uh, surfing. To riding the wave. You know, I, I have the privilege of living just 500 yards up the road, very close to the Varsal seafront. So I often go down walking in the mornings and, and I watch the surfers. <laughs> and they're an amazing bunch. First of all, they're not a fair weather bunch. They go out in all weathers. In fact, probably the, the worse the weather, the, the happier they are. And uh, so there they are, whatever the sea temperature is, they're out there waiting for the waves. And they do wait wave after wave. Um, when they've received a wave and, and done a bit of surfing, if it was not much of a wave, well, they go out and wait for another one, and they wait and they wait until a bigger wave comes along, as come it does. And they ride those waves and enjoy it. Now, I've never done that. I don't know if any of you here are surfers, as I look around. Well, a few of you are built to be surfers. I am certainly not, <laughs> but uh, I do admire them. And there's something in that, I think, that gives us a spiritual lesson that helps us today. So we're going to look at the first post-resurrection um, uh, words of Jesus in John chapter 20 and uh, from verse 19. John chapter 20. Uh, have we got a PowerPoint there? Riding the wave too, it's called. There we go. Riding the wave, my Holy Spirit journey. We're going to read John chapter 20 and verses 19 to 23. Sorry, the words on the screen are not terribly bright for you this morning. I did try and correct that, but it hasn't quite worked out. So we're in John chapter, but I'll read them clearly for you. John chapter 20 and from verse 19. <clears throat> I'm going to have to read them from the screen because I haven't got my glasses. <laughs> yeah. Matt, would you like to go to my car, please? And on the back seat... On the back seat is my jacket, and in the jacket is my glasses. <laughs> it's all open, mate. Even the, you could keys in it, you could even drive it away. This is Guernsey. We don't lock our cars. <clears throat> well, I don't anyway. Perhaps you do. John chapter 20 and verse 19. Um, would someone like to read that for me? Because I really can't. I, well, yes, I could see it up there. On the evening of that first day of the week... When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. You, sir, are greatly blessed. <laughs> and so am I to receive my glasses. Wow. There you go. Ah, the world comes alive. And so this is our first reading. And notice the words I've put in bold. Jesus breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. Then just a matter of a, two or three weeks later, before Jesus ascended to his Father's right hand, in Acts chapter 1 and verses 3 to 5, 
we read these words. After his suffering, Jesus showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Notice that promise. In a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now he's just said to them, receive the Holy Spirit three weeks before. And now he's saying, but there's more. There's another wave coming. You've had one wave, I breathed on you. And something happened in you at that moment. But now there's another wave coming in a few days' time. Let's read on. And um, so when they were met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus here is saying, all right, I breathed on you three weeks ago, but there's something else going to happen to you in a few days, and you're going to receive some power in that experience. When this next wave comes, it's going to carry you into a new dimension of power-filled living. And uh, the word power, as many of you will know, uh, if you're Bible scholars, um, in the original, in the Greek, is dunamis. And today we talk about dynamite, which is drawn from that word. And the Holy Spirit brings power and changes lives as a result of that power. So think again about these disciples receiving the risen Lord Jesus into their presence. What a shock it must have been for Jesus to appear in the room. And his presence among them is to signal something quite remarkable. He breathes on them in John And says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And I just want to ask you today to think about your own experience of God. Your own experience of the Holy Spirit. And to ask yourself, is there more for me than I've experienced already? In John 20, they have a breath from Jesus. And they receive blessing and life. It's all about forgiveness, it seems, if you follow the context through to the next verse. But in Acts chapter 2, they receive the power of the Spirit and become witnesses and preachers. And all their fear goes. And I think the key word I would use in the Acts of the Apostles about um, the change that came over them is the word boldness. They were filled with boldness to become Christian witnesses and to minister in the Spirit wherever they went. They spoke with new tongues. They experienced gifts of the Spirit. But their lives were transformed from fearful locked doors to outgoing, ministering people, bringing healings, bringing blessing wherever they went, seeing the new church of Jesus Christ established. So there were different waves. And and on and on through the Acts of the Apostles, there were five different occasions when people were referred to as being filled with the Holy Spirit. On into the book of 1 Corinthians, and Paul talks about the church being a place where the Holy Spirit ministers through the gifts of the Spirit, through tongues, interpretation, and prophecy, where there are healings and miracles, where people are receiving power from God. On into Ephesians, and Paul says, be continually filled with the Spirit. There are more waves coming. And I believe that God has more for us, that we can come And in the words of there was a song we we were singing a few years ago that said, there must be more than this. And if your experience of Christianity is such that you say, there must be more than this, then the time has come for us to be hungry and thirsty for God to do more and to send more of his spirit upon us. During the 1990s, when I had the privilege of leading the Cardiff City Church, City Temple as it was called then, um, there was a real move of the spirit of God. And during that season, we learned to pray a very simple prayer, a two-word prayer. We used to pray, more, Lord. We used to simply pray, more, Lord. And God sent more by his Spirit. Are you waiting for a wave? Are you in that, perhaps, that in-between period when things are a bit low? This Sunday is called in the Church of England, Low Sunday, (laughs) because it follows straight after Easter. 
And maybe you're feeling a bit low today, whether watching online or here in the, in the service. But I, I want you to know that God's Spirit is coming. God's Spirit is moving. And that we can experience a new wave of the Spirit. John Calvin, writing 500 years ago at the time of the Reformation of the Church in Europe, said that in John chapter 20, when the Lord Jesus breathed on the disciples, he describes them as having the experience of being sprinkled with the Spirit. But in Acts chapter 2, they were saturated in the Spirit, says Calvin. Sprinkled with the Spirit, saturated in the Spirit. The word baptized in the Holy Spirit that Jesus said, after a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When we baptize people in water in this baptistry that we've got here under the platform, you see them go right down under the water and they come up and they're absolutely soaked. (laughs) And Jesus was saying to them, well, here's a breath, here's a foretaste, but there's more, there's more, there's more. And you can be saturated I can be saturated with the power of the Spirit if we're hungry and thirsty for more. So for the disciples, when Pentecost came, when the Holy Spirit came in his fullness to them, it was a journey that was going to change their lives. They took another step on a journey that was going to change their lives. They were never going to be the same again. And that boldness came upon them. I remember when I... um, first became a Christian and got involved in, in evangelism, in reaching out to others. I was in a, a band called Soul Enterprise, and we used to sing sometimes in, in town and outside the town church or outside Boots, or we would go to a gig and, and sing there, or we would, we would sing in churches, and we would tell our story, we would tell the gospel. Uh, we were not very good musically, but we were very keen. And um, there was an occasion when we went, a whole group of young people from the churches went to the management of what was then called the Popular Cafe. Does anybody here remember the Popular Cafe? Put your hand up if you remember the Popular Cafe. There's a sprinkling of us here. Okay, thanks. It was called the Pop Inn, the Popular Cafe. It was only open in the day, so we we asked the manager or the owner if we could open it in the evening as a Christian coffee bar. And so um, that's what we did, and we put all tables out and put, you know, black... um, polythene over the windows and, you know, really changed the atmosphere. And uh, the band would sing and speak about Jesus at the front, and people would talk on the tables to folk who came in about, uh, share their faith and encouragement with them. And uh, in the first two or three weeks that that was on, it was such hard work. We were really struggling. And then the pastor of the Delancey Elam Church came to that, watched us, and afterwards he said, can I meet you boys? And, And he met with us in the band. And he said to us, you know, you guys... You're doing so well in your own strength. You've done all you can. But it's hard work, isn't it? He said, yeah, we said it's hard work. Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And we said, never even heard about this baptism in the Holy Spirit. And uh, and he, he opened to us the book of Acts and elsewhere in the scriptures, the promises of Jesus, which we'll look at in a moment. And, and he taught us we needed to be filled with the Spirit. We needed to move on. We'd had the breath of the Lord, which had given us life. We had a testimony. You know, it it can be sad sometimes that if the disciples had, if you can imagine this, the disciples had said after John chapter 20, oh, he's breathed on us. Oh, well, we're fine. We're done now. We're in. We got our ticket for heaven. We're okay. We don't need anything more. They'd have missed out on Pentecost. And they'd have missed out on all the more that there was ahead of them in the New Testament. But no, they decided to press on and we must also. So we received the power of the Holy Spirit. I was baptized in the Spirit. The other guys were. Diane was at that time. Several of us were. And what a transformation came at the pop in. In the last three or four weeks of the mission there, we saw a large number of young people. I seem to remember the figure of 40 or 50 young people coming to know Jesus as their Savior. The difference was the Spirit was at work in them through us and not just us at work. The Spirit was working And we need that anointing. It's what changed the early church. There's a a well-known worship leader called Graham Kendrick uh, who has spent his life writing great worship songs and leading worship, Spring Harvest, and places like that. And he recently said in an interview, I remember people started talking, says Graham, about the Holy Spirit. He was a Christian in his teens. He was a Baptist believer. He says, I remember people started talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says, I was really hungry for that. I was fed up with reading about it in books. I wanted to taste it myself. And that set me on a journey, which resulted in me being filled with the Holy Spirit. That was a release moment, says Kendrick, 
We have to restore the balance, I think. When you put the word, that the Bible, and the spirit together, it's absolute dynamite. <laughs> he said that in a, a recent interview in Christianity magazine. And his whole life went on to be an expression of the spirit in worship. And his songs have gone all around the world and have impacted so many as the spirit has anointed what the man was able to do, how we need the Spirit to help us in our lives, to live in our circumstances, to serve others. Teachers need the Holy Spirit to help them at school. Parents need the Holy Spirit to help them with their children. Um, nurses need the Holy Spirit to care for the sick. There are so many areas in which we need God's help to live the Christian life. And I want to say just two simple things before I close with a prayer this morning. It's this. Firstly, receiving the power of the Spirit is better than Jesus being on earth. Wow. You might say, yeah, but if he was on earth, I'd get on a plane and I'd go and see him. You know, if he was still here in the physical body, moving around, uh, surely that would be better. But Jesus said in John chapter 16 and verse 7, It is better for you that I go away. It is to your advantage, he said, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit, the Helper, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. So what Jesus is saying is, you know, it's great. He's in one place. He's able to touch one life here, one life there, whatever. But when the Holy Spirit comes on us, we all become filled with the Christ spirit. We all become able to touch people, to pray for people, I dare to say to heal people, to bring life to people, to speak a word of life, to prophesy, to bring a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. These are the gifts that come to us because the spirit of God is in us. So receiving the power of the spirit is better than Jesus being on earth. Why? Because God's spirit will not just be with us, he will be in us. Jesus actually said that. I will ask the Father, John 14, verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit, said Jesus, who leads into all truth. The world can't receive him, but you know him because he lives with you and will be in you. There's a degree, isn't there? there? There's, a, you know, there's a moving forward. And where are we on our Holy Spirit journey? Are we hungry for more? Do we want more? Jesus said, blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty after righteousness. Why? Because they shall be filled. Is there still a spiritual hunger in your heart? I've been on this Christian road in ministry for 50 years, but I'm still so hungry for more. There must be more than this. I'm longing for the Spirit of God to move again in power in our midst. I want to see people saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with God's power, able to go out and serve him in the world. And also, why is it better for the Holy Spirit to come than Jesus to be on earth? Well, because God's Spirit can lead us closer to Jesus. God's Spirit points us to Jesus. Um, Jesus himself said, again in John 14, 26, he said... He will teach you, the Spirit will teach you all things, and he will remind you of everything I have said to you. So the Holy Spirit points us to Jesus. A hundred years ago, when the Elim movement started, and there were remarkable and Spirit-anointed men like George Jeffries and others going around holding huge missions and crusades around the UK and seeing thousands of people come to Jesus and amazing healing miracles taking place, at that time, they coined a rather odd-sounding phrase, odd to us in our modern ears, but it was called the four-square gospel. And the four-square gospel they preached was this, Jesus the Savior, Jesus the healer, Jesus the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, and Jesus the coming king. But it was all about Jesus. <laughs> it wasn't about tongues, it wasn't about healing, it wasn't about the Holy Spirit, it was all about Jesus. And we need to be careful not to seek the gifts more than the giver. But if we seek God, the Holy Spirit, and his fullness in our lives, Jesus will become more real to us day by day. And we will be reminded of the teaching of Jesus as we go through our week. So why is it better for Jesus 
to go and the Spirit to come. Because through God's Spirit, the supernatural becomes natural. The supernatural world becomes natural. And we can speak a word into someone's life. We can pray a prayer that makes a difference. We can pray for healing and see amazing things happen. We can see God intervene in situations that otherwise were closed up. We receive guidance at critical points in our lives. We don't have time to look into it, but in Acts chapter 16, Paul, the apostle, talks about when his team was seeking to move through Asia, preaching the gospel, modern Turkey, and they got to a place called Bithynia. They wanted to go there, and they wanted to preach Christ there, which sounds like a good motive, but the scripture says in Acts 16 and verses 6 and 7, but the Spirit of Jesus would not let us. And then during the night, Paul had a dream, a spirit-filled dream, in which a man of Macedonia appeared to him and said, come over and help us. And they went a different way. Holy Spirit guidance took them there. Holy Spirit can guide you. Holy Spirit can guide me and help us to know the way we should live our lives. And then there's all the lovely fruit, the, the supernatural fruit. And it, it is supernatural. Love and joy and peace and uh, patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. These are the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. And doesn't our world need these things today? More of God's Spirit. More, Lord. More, Lord. We need another wave. We need a new anointing. Years ago, we used to pray in the prayer meeting and sing sometimes, oh, for a new anointing. And we need a new wave of God's Spirit in our hearts, in our churches, in our lives. Why? Because when there is such a move, people will be drawn to Jesus and get saved. On the day of Pentecost, when the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and new boldness came into them, Peter stood up and preached Jesus to the very people who had crucified him. And at the end of his sermon, 3,000 people were converted on one day. And, you know, that's what happened to us in the pop-in, not 3,000 people. But, you know, we, we saw the difference between what we did and what the Holy Spirit could do through us so much more effectively. And um, oh, I just thank God for the moving of his spirit in my life and, uh, and in the church. And there's that lovely verse in Ephesians 5.18, be continually filled with the spirit, O oh Lord, that we might see more. And so I just want to close with this second simple thing. And it is that um, receiving the power of the Spirit is for all who are thirsty. Receiving the power of the Spirit is for all who are thirsty. And if nothing else happens today as a result of you being in church this morning, I pray that God will make us all thirsty for more of him. That you'll go out of this place and you'll say, well, I didn't get it all, I didn't understand it all, but I am thirsty for more. I do want another wave. I do want to move forward. I do want to learn um, to move forward in God and experience his spirit at a new level. On that day when Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, uh, the people were so convicted in their hearts by the power of the spirit. Remember, Jesus said that the spirit would convict them. Well, they were convicted and Peter replied, they, they were cut to their heart, it says in verse 37. And they said, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise of the Holy Spirit is for you and your children and for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. In other words, we need to recognize that the promise is for us. The, the, when Peter said that, he was thinking generationally. He was saying, for you, for your children, and all who are afar off generationally. Well, that's us. Those who down the centuries are still naming the name of Jesus. We are the ones for whom the promise is real. The promise is for you. And we are the ones whom the gospel calls to follow Jesus. And the promise of the Holy Spirit is for us. There was an occasion in the life of Jesus when he went to the temple during a special feast. And in that feast on the last day, the priest used to pour water out in the temple courts as a symbol of thanksgiving for harvest and, and for the, um, the water that gives life. 
And as the water was being outpoured in the temple, Jesus began to speak very loudly. We read, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice. So it wasn't just something he said, it was something he proclaimed. And what did he proclaim? Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Remember the waters being outpoured by the priest. And when the people hear the sound of the pouring water, maybe some of them were thirsty. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from deep within. And by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus is glorified now, so the Spirit is given, and he's never been withdrawn. Some people think that at the end of the New Testament, the Spirit was called back. Come back, Holy Spirit. You're not needed now because they got the Bible. So the new trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible. They don't need the Spirit anymore. But the Bible does not allow us to say that. Because the scripture tells us that the spirit is the eternal spirit. He is not withdrawn. He is given because Jesus is glorified. And he's still being given today again and again and again. Around the world, more people are coming to faith in Jesus today than have ever come to faith every day. Because around the world, there's a great awakening in Africa and South America and in the far corners of, uh, of Europe. And even in Ukraine, with all its suffering and horrors, people are coming to faith in Jesus at this time. And uh, I thank God the Spirit is still given. He has never been withdrawn. And um, Jesus said, when you, when you come to me and drink, something happens deep within you. It, you I, I'm no great Bible scholar, but I do know that when the, the phrase deep within or within you is used in that context, it's actually the word womb in the Greek, the original. And, uh, and what happens is that when we receive the Holy Spirit, there is a spiritual womb placed within us from which new life can flow and people can receive blessing and help and strength through us. Some things happen deep within. We become reproductive of the Spirit of God and of the grace of God in a community that desperately needs His help. How? Well, if you then said, Jesus... Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That's what it's, it's as simple as that. You need to ask him for more of his spirit. You need to ask him for more spiritual life. You need to say, Lord, I, I thank you for the breath I've received, but I want to be baptized, I want to be soaked in the Spirit, I want to be filled with more of you. More, Lord, should be our prayer. And if you are afraid of the Holy Spirit, and afraid of the change he might bring, and you say, oh, I don't know if I want that, that's a bit weird, I don't know if I want to go down that road. Well, can I just say to you, Jesus says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. You know, as parents, we love to give our children gifts when it's appropriate and to watch their faces as they open the package. And we wouldn't put something horrible in there so that they would open the package and go, ugh. Actually, in the wider context, Jesus says, if, if one of you had a child asking for an egg, would you give him a scorpion? Can you imagine that? Can I have an egg, Daddy, please? And when you open it up, up comes a scorpion. And that's a horrible image. And Jesus says, come on, I'm your loving heavenly father. If you ask me for the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to give you something horrible that's going to sting you. <laughs> There's only good gifts that come from above, from the father of lights in whom there is neither variableness, nor the shadow of turning. Only good gifts come from him. So let us be open. Let us seek now. Come back, please, uh, musicians. Come and help us with the song, Holy Spirit. Um, you are welcome here. And, and let's allow this to be a prayer for all of us. I don't want to embarrass individuals by saying, you know, stand at the front or wave your hand or whatever. But I do want to say, let's all make a response. Because the, the, the challenge is that the Holy Spirit is available for those who ask for him. 
who say, I'm, I'm here, Lord, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I want more, more, Lord, in my life to help me at this time. So we'll sing, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And, and let's make it our prayer that he will help us to ride the wave, uh, our own Holy Spirit journey. And that today, each of us will, at whatever stage we're at, receive something new from God. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing it together. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. As we come to this our song of worship, we have this opportunity earlier in the service to just take up our offerings. So as part of our worship, just in the first part of this song, the uh, offering will be taken as well. Mm, thank you, Ian. Praise God. <clears throat> There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your living home. Your presence I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of love Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone In your presence Make this your prayer. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord.
Thank you, Lord, that you, your desire is to fill us to overflowing again and again. Lord, you, your promises and your mercy and your Holy Spirit is new and fresh every morning. And Lord, we pray as we go from this place today, Lord, that we wouldn't just be content with coming here once a week and knowing your presence amongst us, but we would tomorrow morning, tomorrow lunchtime, every hour of the day, Lord, we would be crying out to you and asking you to fill us more of your Holy Spirit, that we might live lives that are honouring to you, that bless you, and that bless others, Lord, by bringing your Spirit into their lives, by bringing your truth and your gospel to fruition in other people's lives. So go with us now as we, as we go our separate ways, Lord, and as we meet and fellowship together. Lord, will you continue with us? Amen. Amen. Ian, Lynn, Pete, Deb, Sandy, thank you so much for leading us beautifully. Eric, thank you for your word. I believe that there's some people in the room, maybe online, that just say, would you pray for me? And, you know, the coffee's on. Please come to the front. We'd love to pray for you for fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Chris, Evelyn, Charlotte, you've done wonderfully well. Thank you so much. Uh, do please hang around. Uh, we've got tea and coffee, and we'll see you later on at six o'clock. God bless you. I hope you have a really good week. Mm-hmm.